My name is Morgan Lusk, and I'm uh, thrilled to, to be here with you all today to have uh, the privilege to come and uh, share the word with you this morning. Um, just a couple things about me real quick. I uh, was born originally in Jacksonville, Florida, and um, so that should tell you who I am pulling for, in the, or rather who I am not pulling for in the Super Bowl, right? Um, so I, Jags fan, I'm an Oles fan, I'm adopted into the Florida State family, I didn't go there, but you know, go Knowles. And, um, my, my wife and kids are here this morning, uh, uh, Jennifer, she was born in Tampa and uh, grew up in Spring Hill, and then uh, we have three boys, Nathaniel, Elijah, and Isaac, and um, uh, we actually adopted Nathaniel and Elijah uh, from Uganda in 2013, so they're, um, they're 11 and 8 years old back then, they were uh, 6 and 4, uh, and I just wanted to this morning uh, kind of share some of that story with you guys because I think that it helps to illustrate our passage this morning from uh, Ephesians 1, 3, and 6. And if you have a Bible, you can go ahead and turn there now, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 6, or, or on your Bible app. Um, and, and just real quick, our, our adoption story uh, for me and Jennifer is about a lot of different things, uh, about wanting to be parents, about uh, wanting to um, just have children be welcomed into our home, um, about wanting to, to reach out to some, some abandoned children and, and give them a home that they otherwise wouldn't have. Um, but, but really, the, the primary thing behind our story is, is love. Um, uh, our love for these kids, but, but more importantly, um, wanting to imitate or, or reflect, however we could, uh, God's adoptive love toward us that we find in the gospel. So, um, in early 2013, we had been praying about this, and uh, we, we had kind of seen some, some ways that God had moved and, and brought about some connections, and um, so we, we felt like it was time to adopt, uh, and, and we also felt pretty strongly that uh, Uganda was the place that we were going to adopt from there, and that we wanted not one, but at least two children from a, a sibling group. Um, <clears throat> long story short, we were, we were given a, a picture of these two sweet little boys smiling back at the camera, and we were just hooked. I mean, like, we, we loved them right then and there. The moment we saw that picture, uh, we loved them as our kids, as our sons, and we could not wait to adopt them and to meet them. Uh, and this was not something that we were doing out of some sort of, like, duty, or we weren't, we weren't forced to do this. No one was saying, hey, you have to do this. It was something we did out of delight. It was our pleasure. It was, it was out of love to adopt these boys to make them our sons. So we flew to Africa in uh, July of 2013, and we spent over a month there on, on their home turf, um, kind of learning you know, some things about them and, and what they've been through. And, uh, and we brought them home in August, and they've lived with us ever since. And so this story, in a very limited way, sort of illustrates what, it, what Paul is talking about in Ephesians 1, um, which is that um, God's love for us is, is, is adoptive, and, and it is so deep and it's so unconditional um, that, that we really can't even begin to scratch the surface of it. So uh, let's read God's word from Ephesians 1, starting in verse 3. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. So just to kind of orient us here uh, in a biblical timeline, this is Paul writing a letter to the Ephesians, to, to his church in Ephesus, um, and this would have taken place uh, 20 to 30 years after uh, Christ had his, his public ministry, and then, you know, he uh, is, is crucified, and he rises from the dead, and he ascends into heaven, um, and he, he gives his Holy Spirit so that the, the apostles and the disciples and, and all of, of those who followed Christ might, uh, might have the comforter, the counselor. Um, as they were to go out and, and share the gospel, spread the gospel uh, in, in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and all the nations. Um, and Paul, one of these apostles, is, is primarily working in certain parts of the Roman Empire, planting churches. 
And every time he would plant a church, and he got it established with, with a, a, like a church government, um, he, he would then leave and go plant another one. But he always was careful to keep in contact with his churches. If they were going through something, and he, or maybe he just wanted to encourage them. Uh, so he was writing these letters, and that's uh, a, a big chunk of the New Testament is Paul writing these letters to, to his churches. Um, and so that's where we are in Ephesians. And, and as he begins the letter, he is just excited. And I, I don't know if you can tell by the way he writes this, but really verses 3 through 14 like in the Greek, there are no punctuations there. I mean, it just, he just doesn't stop. He just keeps going on and on and on. And he's so excited about God's glorious plan for, for salvation and God's love for us in, in Christ. And, and he, he is just overflowing with excitement about what God has done. And, and the first thing he says about that, about what God has done, is that we see that he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And so that's the, the first point, is that God's adoptive love means we are blessed beyond measure. And you may hear that about, about blessing, and you may start to think in your, in your minds about material blessing, like you have a car or a house or uh, you know, a 401k or a job or, or um, even like you know, your relationships, your, your family, your your pets, whatever. You, those are wonderful blessings that God has given all of us. And, but that's not really what Paul is talking about here. He's, he's actually talking about something even more um, long-lasting and, and even uh, maybe more mysterious. He's talking about spiritual blessings because he says every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. So what are those? Well, we... We know that, that Jesus, when he died on the cross, uh, did not stay dead. Like Death could not handle him. Like he, he defeated it when he rose from the dead. And so then he, he, in Acts 1, we read he, is, he ascends into heaven. And then in Hebrews 1, we read that he, even right now, is sitting at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. And, and he rules over everything. Everything is, is happening. Everything is like holding together because... He's making it happen. That's, that's what he's doing right now. And he's in the heavenly places. And so if we have every spiritual blessing that is in the heavenly places, then we have every spiritual blessing that Jesus has right now, which is like all of them, infinity of them. It's, we, we can literally probably sit here for years and talk about it and, and never cover it all because it's, it is unimaginable the way we have been blessed in Christ. But if you wanted to summarize it under a heading, you could say kingdom, kingdom of God. Jesus is now establishing his kingdom. Uh, you, you can kind of start to, to see it. It is, it is visible in some ways, uh, and it is maybe even growing more visible, um, but it's not fully visible yet. Um, because Jesus isn't here on earth reigning and ruling with us yet. But he will be one day, and then the kingdom will be fully visible. So we're kind of in that you know, middle, in-between time. Um, but all of the kingdom blessings that we will have when he returns, our, they're, they're already ours. We just don't necessarily get to see them all yet. It's, it's kind of like... Um, the, the time between when we started adopting the boys and we were doing all this paperwork and working with the government, which is great fun, and then uh, in, in the Ugandan government is even more fun. But uh, that time between January and, and July when we were doing all that process, you know, the boys, they were in an orphanage in Uganda. We were over here stateside and had not met them yet. They, I mean, we did a Skype call with them once, but that's really which is kind of the tip of the iceberg. Um, but in that time, they had a house. They had a, had a room of their own. They had beds of their own. They had toys and clothes and shoes, and they had pets. And, I mean, we were stocking the pantry. Like, you know, we're going we're gonna, to maybe, maybe have even looked like doomsday preppers a little bit. But, I mean, all of that stuff was theirs because it was ours, and we were sharing our stuff with them, 
and yet they didn't get to experience that yet. And so it's similar for us who are in Christ because all of the spiritual blessings of the kingdom of God, they're ours right now. We just don't fully experience those things until Jesus returns. But until then, we, we experience them definitely somewhat now. Um, like just being able to know God. I mean, just think about that for a second. We have access to the Father through Jesus Christ, through the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. We can know him. We can know him through his word, which is true and trustworthy. We have the Holy Spirit in our hearts. And, and I, this is one of the things that I just continually am amazed by is that, like I don't know about you, but I sometimes when I'm praying, I'm just like, yeah, I, 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 I don't know. I mean, but then the, Holy, the Bible says the Holy Spirit intercedes for us, groans with, with groanings too deep for us to understand. That's Romans 8, 26 and 27. What a blessing that is, that the Holy Spirit is literally, literally in our hearts praying for us. And then we have a church. We have a, a community of, of believers who are, and by the way, one of the things about the church that is so amazing is that you can have nothing in common with another believer, like nothing, no language in common, nothing. And yet, if you have Christ in common, then you have the most important uniting factor in the world in common. And so you, you can share that, that common bond. And, and so then you can, you can pray with one another. You encourage one another. You hold another, one another accountable. You carry one another's burdens, as it says in Galatians 6.2. I want to focus on that last one, uh, carrying burdens. You know, because it doesn't necessarily say in this text, but elsewhere in the scriptures we read that if, if we are blessed in Christ, um, that blessing is not meant to end on us. Like it's, yeah, I mean, God delights in just blessing us, but also wants us to bless other people. It's like um, when God shows up to Abraham in Genesis 12, he says, I'm blessing you so that you will be a blessing to the nations. And that's the whole story of the people of God is that God is saying you're not just blessed for the sake of being blessed, you're also blessed to bless the nations so that the nations might know of who God is, so that the nations might become worshipers of God. So we are, we are called, if we know Christ, to bless other people, to be gracious to others, to, uh, to pray with others, to, to give, to give to, to uh, God's kingdom work. Um, to mourn with those who mourn, rejoice with those who rejoice. Uh, if, we are, if we are blessed by God, if he has called you, or if he has called me out of, out of darkness and into light, into the light of Christ, then we really ought to every single day be asking the question, who can I bless? Who is God put into my life that he's calling me to be a, a blessing to them? And I think that's a question that each of us needs to think through. So if we are blessed beyond measure in Christ, and if that is not enough to sufficiently blow our minds, here's another one. God's adoptive love means we were chosen before creation. This is uh, verse 4. If you're a follower of Jesus, it's because God has chosen you before the foundation of the world, before time. Um, When someone becomes a Christian, if someone trusts in Jesus for the first time, God is not surprised by that because he planned it. He, he chose for that to happen. Um, and it's not just that he planned it. Romans eight twenty nine tells us that God also foreknew those whom he predestined. And so if, if we are loved by God, we are, we are chosen and known by God from before time, before there was ever even such a thing as planet earth. He chose us and he knew us. And so going back to our adoption story, you know, we chose to adopt Nathaniel and Elijah before they ever knew us, before there was any kind of relationship between us and them. And and they could not choose that. They could not legally put themselves into our family. And and I don't think they would have been able to, like, make the 7,000-mile trip across the Atlantic Ocean to get to us to put themselves into our family. And so that would have been an impossibility. But we chose them. 
we chose them, and they had no idea. Now, I realize this illustration, it breaks down at some point, but the key thing here is that we had nothing to do with our salvation. It is all a work of God, and, and really the reason for that is because of our sin. Um, Romans 3, 10 and 11 talks about how no one is righteous, no one understands, no one seeks God, and that's really kind of a bleak picture because we can try all we want to seek God, but apart from him choosing us first, we will not love him. We must be loved by God first. And so that's why the gospel is that God makes us a new creation, that God gives us a new heart, that salvation is a gift of God. So we are passive recipients of this gift that that God actively secured for us through the perfect life, the sacrificial death, and the victorious resurrection of Jesus Christ, his Son. So was that only about salvation, or specifically, was that only about justification, or was there something more? And really what the text says is that God not only chose us, but he chose us to make us holy and blameless before him. So the word holy, right, that gets like a bad rap. I mean, you hear holy, and you probably think of someone who feels like they're holier than you. Like, I'm holier than thou, I'm, you know, I'm a perfect Christian, like, um, and, and that's really self-righteousness. And that's not what holiness is, according to the Bible. According to the Bible, yeah, it's about righteousness, but it's about Jesus' righteousness, not yours, not mine. It's about his. And so biblical holiness is actually more about being set apart or, or being marked as you're one who belongs to God. And then because we belong to God, we, we pursue him and we want to walk with him. We want to be obedient to his commands because we belong to him and he's given us a new heart made us a new creation and we get to walk in in Christ's righteousness and and that looks like just us beginning more and more to to think and to desire the things that he desires and, and to sort of live like he lives but it's a lifelong process I mean we don't ever stop doing this if we're a believer and and so that, that whole process from the time we become a believer to, to, our, to our death is a gift. It's a gift of being made more holy in Christ. And um, God, though in that gift, in that process, also works through, through channels, like where he kind of channels his grace to us, and that's through his word. That's why we want to dig into his word and uh, and, and know his word and, and even hide it in our hearts. That's why we want to have a deep prayer life so we're connecting and, and communicating with him and sharing and, and confessing before him. Um, that's why we want to belong to a church and, and serve in a church so that, so that we are being, you know, kind of iron sharpening iron with each other and, and serving together. And this, this is not about having some sort of checklist like on your fridge that you, at the end of every day, I check that off, got it, got it, got it. God's you know, I guess he, he loves me today. It's not what it's about. It's, it's about that God first loved you. And, and so now he is putting desires in you um, that, that are causing you to want to walk with him. And so that, that is, of course, a, a spiritual blessing, again, that Jesus shares with us. But there's more. God's adoptive love also means that we get a new family identity. And this is really crucial because I feel like it's it's the the thing that that sets apart God's love for us from any other type of love that you can imagine. I mean, we we just throw that word love around like, you know, like I I love burgers, man, you know. Or I I love this, I love that. We we need to kind of differentiate between God's love and, like, I, I love food. So, you know, most Americans will say that they believe in God in some form or another, like, um, I, I believe in God or a God or gods or, or you know, he's some force or something. Uh, and they may also say that God loves them. But I feel like our, our, as, as, a, as a whole, 
our love for God or our concept of our love that God has for us is pretty weak. Um, I feel like a lot of people think of God sort of like Superman. You know, like he flies to a burning building, you know, picks you up, say, like, flies you back to some safe place, drops you off, and is just like, peace out. You don't see him again. He, he's out there. He's powerful. He'll save you in a pinch. And, uh, you know, if you're falling off a bridge or something, he's good. He got you. But, I mean, he doesn't really want to know you. Doesn't really want to know your brokenness and, 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 and be there with you in those, in those painful moments. Um, so some people think of God that way. Or maybe you think that God doesn't love you at all. Maybe you think that he just is kind of waiting for an opportunity to like strike you in one of his bolts, you know, like a lightning bolt, you know, like, um, or may- maybe you think that he's angry at you. I've, I've felt that a lot in my life, that he's just kind of angry at me all the time, and that every time I mess up, he's up there to like, you did it again! I can't believe this! Oh my gosh, how- I've got to start all over with my plans, because you messed it all up. You ever... You ever think of God that way? Verses 5 and 6 tell us something very different about God's love for us. Um, Paul says that he adopts us to himself as sons. And, and I didn't say this in the first service. I, I want to make sure we understand that when he says sons there, he, in, he includes men and women. Like he, He's not just saying just guys. Um, but the son, the word son there is really trying to tell us something about an inheritance, that, that we get an inheritance from him. Um, but that he, he does this, he adopts us, and it's to the praise of his glorious grace because, of the, because that's his will, because that's what he wanted to do. It's what he delighted to do, to bless us in that way, to unite us with his beloved who is Christ. And so if we belong to Jesus, we know God's love is not cold and it is not distant. It is adoptive and it is fatherly and he wants to know us intimately and he wants us to know him intimately. And we know that because because of what adoption is. Adoption is a stranger, an an orphan, getting a new name and, and coming into a new family that is a forever family and uh getting a seat at a dinner table and getting a room and a bed to call their own and, and living in this home like it's their home. You, you ever hear kids say to their friends, like, hey, come to my house, like it's really their house, you know? They, you paying the mortgage? That, whoa. I guess I shouldn't have told that joke. But, um, but it is their house, right? I mean, It is their house, and God invites us even to call him Abba Father, to to call him Daddy, and to have a share in the inheritance that he has given to his only begotten son, Jesus. And so we're not strangers anymore. We are, uh, as as Paul says in Ephesians 2, 18 and 19, he says, we have access to God the Father, We are no longer strangers or aliens. We are fellow citizens of the household of God. We're his kids. So if we belong to Jesus, we are so loved by God that that every single right, every privilege, every blessing that a son could ever have from a father and more is ours. And that means we have a completely new identity. So as we brought Nathaniel and Elijah back to the States, um, one, one of the cool things that happened afterwards is we started to go through this legal process of them truly be, becoming adopted legally. So um, their names originally were not Nathaniel and Elijah, but we gave them new names. And then we, obviously they took our last name. Um, and then they got, they got new birth certificates, United States birth certificates, which we were told, which I didn't know this before, we were told that now in the eyes of at least the government, um, these birth certificates mean that it's just as if they had been born in the States to us as biological parents. That's how they look at it. 
And, and I, I was blown, my mind was blown by that, because that's, I think that, that was so cool. I couldn't believe the government came up with that. And so, I'm, I'm sorry if you're a government worker, I, I apologize. But um, they have completely new identities as sons in our family. Completely new. Uh, and, and now, of course, God has seen fit to bless us with a, a biological son, Isaac, uh, with, with the cool specs. And uh, he is a joy. He's a blessing. He just turned two. And uh, his name, Isaac, means laughter. Uh, he lives up to it every single day. And when he cries, it's like a shock. I can't even believe it, you know. And, but he, he does cry. But rarely will you ever hear us say anything about having biological or adoptive sons. Uh, because they are our sons. It, we don't really make a distinction between the two statuses. We, they're just our sons. And in the same way, in God's grace, he sees us all as having the same identity, the same kind of status as his only begotten son, Jesus. So we, in Christ, we have a new spiritual birth certificate. So that change in identity, that that change in, in family is so radical that it, it can only be of God. And it's so radical that, in fact, the metaphor of going from, from orphan to son does not really even do it justice. Because Ephesians 2.1, Paul talks about how we are dead in our sins before we know Jesus. Not, not just okay. You know, we're going along okay, and then, and then kind of God gives us a boost. We're dead in our sins. And then in Ephesians 2.5, he says, but God made us alive together with Christ. So the change in identity is not from spiritual orphans to spiritual sons. It is spiritual corpses to spiritual sons. It's not from, we went from living kind of a hard life to living a good life. It's from, we had no life. And now we have it because of God. And so again, this can only be of God because it's about breathing new life into those who are spiritually dead. So what is, just in in closing, what does this change in identity mean for us? And I wanted to kind of give you a framework for this. Um, Because it means everything, but there's a couple of specific things to think about. So Galatians 4, 6 and 7 says, and because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. So the, the framework is that, that having a new identity in Christ means we have a completely new foundation, a completely new, like we've already said, a new creation, a new heart. We have a new MO. We're, we're, we are a completely different person. That's why it talks about being born again. And so like for our boys, when they were in Uganda, didn't have an easy life. Uh, Especially by our standards, they they lived in kind of destitution. Is that a word? Yeah, I think. And I think they were pretty scared all the time. They didn't have much. They weren't treated real well. And I don't think people meant to harm them, but it's, it's, it's stressful to live there. So they were motivated a lot by fear. As most of their behavior, whatever they did, motivated by fear. And Elijah specifically would kind of, at the orphanage, we're told, would really hide and, and clam up and wouldn't talk. And so this was really foreign to us because when we first met Elijah, day one, he was happy. I'll tell you a quick story. So, like, the first day, I'm, I'm carrying little Elijah around. He weighs like 25 pounds. He's light. And he's just looking at me with a smile. And he keeps saying in Lugandan, Yakoko va imboko. I'm like, oh, he looks happy. I think he's telling me he loves me. And I see these Ugandan guys sitting in the corner over here, like, just falling out of their chair laughing. And I'm like, what is going on? So they come up to me, and they're like, he's not telling you he loves you. He's saying he's going to beat you with a stick. (laughs) And I'm like, okay. (laughs) So I know now that the smile, the sweet smile, is an impish grin, and he's just got this humorous, little, little sly, witty personality. But what if... That's, and that's really all we've known of him, but what if all of a sudden Elijah went back into that fear-motivated behavior again, and he just started kind of hiding from us? And, and what if he felt like 
every time he made a mistake, that meant that part of our family, our family, family, family anymore. But well, we would say that that is there is no need for that. You are you have a new identity. You are a new creation in that you are now a part of our family. You are our son. And yes, if you make a mistake, we're going to do you know discipline and, and all that stuff. But it doesn't change your status, your identity as part of our family. You are our son. And we are for our sons. We love our sons. And then if you think about that for a second, how much more then is God for us who are in Christ? Romans 8, 31, if God is for us, who can be against us? So if we belong to Jesus, God is as pleased with us as he is with Jesus. That's, that is the gospel that we get Christ's righteousness as a gift, and so we get the pleasure of God as a gift. So, real quick, if you feel like maybe God is angry at you, that he's up there just kind of waiting for his opportunity to you know, step on you like a little ant or something, I want you to, to hear that in the gospel, as, as Christ has given us his righteousness, and God looks upon us favorably. That, that is because whatever anger God may have had towards, towards our sin was put on Christ 2,000 years ago on a cross. And when, when Jesus died, that died with him. And he rose from the dead, victorious over sin and death. And, and so for us, why would we look anywhere else for identity, for meaning, for value than our new master, Christ, who's, whose yoke and his burden is light and easy. And so that, as far as God's love goes, that is just the tip of the iceberg. But we are chosen, we are, we are blessed, we are adopted, we are given a new family identity. Uh, praise God. Amen. Pray with me. Father, we thank you for your love towards us, which is so unimaginable, so amazing, and we thank you that uh, in Christ we are able to live as new creatures. Help us, Holy Spirit, to do that, trusting in you day by day.